Richard Falk joins me from Istanbul. He is a professor for international law at Princeton University. Really great to speak to you, Professor. So uh, we've had this very long speech from President Erdogan. I don't know how much of it you got to hear. But one of the things he talked about was the relationship between the United States and Turkey going forward. It's a complicated one, isn't it? What do you make of the relationship and how do you see it playing out? Can you hear me, Professor? Oh, yes. I, did, I didn't realize that was directed at me. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. So, um, well, welcome to the program. I was just asking you about um, the relationship between Turkey and the United States. President Erdogan has just talked about um, that relationship, particularly his, his relationship with President Trump, and talked about um, it being, uh, he, him being a frank and honest person to talk to. What do you make of that relationship? Well, I think it's, it's a uh, troubled relationship. At the same time, I think underneath, uh, the two leaders have a certain kind of uh, respect for one another. And my uh, suspicion is that once the, the Syrian context is uh, calm again, if it, if it does become calm, that uh, relations will uh, normalize and there will not be a serious tension. Trump is under some pressure in the United States because the uh, anti-Turkish campaign there has been so intense in exaggerating the nature of the Turkish uh, military operation. And that's uh, created, a, I think, a domestic political problem for Trump with, his, with the Republicans in Congress and with American public opinion and this organized, orchestrated opposition to Turkey that's continued ever since the attempted coup in 2016. And why do you think there's been such a negative reaction to Turkey's actions in Syria from the international community? I, I didn't quite catch. So I was asking why you thought the international community's reaction to Operation Peace Spring had been so negative. Well, as I say, I think that the efforts of certain political forces, in some state forces and some uh, society forces, have joined since, the, since 2016 particularly in trying to orchestrate a insistent uh, attack on the legitimacy of uh, Turkish policy. And this was an opportunity to escalate that attack. Uh, and that comes, I think, uh, ever since uh, 2010, 2011, but it, it uh, became more intense after 2016 with the FETO uh, attempt to uh, mobilize opposition, uh, uncertain backing from Israel, the hardcore Kemalists. Uh, there may be some pressure from Armenian diaspora and also uh, some uh, militant Kurdish groups. All of these coalesced to create an atmosphere that the media was very uh, responsive to. For instance, focusing on human rights infractions in Turkey that are much less serious than what's been going on in Egypt, where they give no attention at all. So one has to assume that there's a political motivation underneath these double standards in media coverage and the uh, way in which uh, public opinion has been shaped in the West, particularly the United States, but also Western Europe, to view the Kurds as uh, the Kurdish people as victims in this uh, current uh, uh, operation uh, 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 peace spring. 
Well, looking at the current status quo, given the complexities in the region, do you think it will last? Well, of course, anyone that makes too firm a prediction about what will happen in the region is being uh, patently foolish. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to me uh, that it is likely, at least in this phase, to last. And I think maybe the Russian presence in uh, the, this Syrian uh, safe zone will actually create a greater regional balance that existed during the Cold War in a different form, but kept the uh, whole region much more stable than it's been in the period since the end of the Cold War and the present time, when there's been, as we all know, intense turmoil, chaos, repressive uh, authoritarian government, uh, behavior, a whole series of uh, tragedies for the populations in these various countries. And just returning to President Trump, to what extent do you think his particular brand of diplomacy has caused problems in the region? Yes, of course. It's unpredictable and it is. it was for a long time uh, much too passive in relation to the two sets of special, so-called special relationships with Israel and Saudi Arabia, seeming to give Israel a green light for doing whatever it wanted, including uh, moving the American embassy to uh, Jerusalem, a very provocative act, contrary to the international consensus on how a solution should be resolved and a series of other uh, steps, including uh, support for the annexation of the Golan Heights, part of uh, Syrian uh, sovereign territory. So Trump has uh, created a kind of uh, imbalance in the region uh, that uh, aggravates a, a set of situations that are uh, already very uh, unstable and chaotic. For instance, uh, reinforcing the Saudi UAE intervention in Yemen, which has uh, been a catastrophic experience for the population. And the uh, overall American policy has been very uneven. It has uh, at times seemed interventionary, at other times it seems as though it's intent on disengaging from the region. And that, of course, makes uh, the allies of the U.S. in the region uh, nervous and uh, may be doing things that will reverse that tendency. So it's a very complex. Syria, from the very beginning, has been one of the most complex conflict uh, situations that has ever existed in history with all the external actors and the various uh, terrorist groups, the various uh, militias, the insurgency internal to Syria. Uh, and the, there's never been a conflict in uh, the last hundred years that has had so many actors and so many uh, unanticipated uh, a aspects to it. Okay, well, thanks very much for your analysis. Richard Falk, Professor for International Law at Princeton University. Many thanks.